All right, let's uh, draw our attention to the Lorenz group. We've seen the, we work in, let me recall, we're working with the Poincaré group. The Poincaré group consists of the translation group and the Lorenz group. Now, the Lorenz group consists of all the transformations, except for translation, of course, that leave delta S square invariant. If we restrict ourselves to those that preserve orientation and direction of time, we get a subgroup called the proper orthochronous Lorenz group. And we represent that with SO plus 1, 3. Now, the proper orthochronous Lorentz group represents the transformations that implement changes from one inertial frame to another. Again, modulo translation, because we already studied translations in, uh, independently. You may not have seen this group formally written oftentimes, but I'm pretty sure that in previous courses, you very likely, whether you have taken any kind of group theory or not, you have probably seen these other two Lie groups, SO3 and SU2. Now, SO3 is the group of rotations in three-dimensional space, and SU2, the group of special unitary transformations um, of dimension two, that is uh, associated with, definitely you've seen it associated with the notion of spin in previous courses. Now, um, it's super interesting because, uh, previous courses, uh, chin. So because of that, at least in linear algebra, you've seen that this group, you represent uh, elements of that group with rotation matrices, right, that you can apply and then get things to rotate in three space. And I'm pretty sure that you have seen things with this, even whether you've seen group theory or not, you've seen that, oh yeah, um, uh, a rotation, a transformation, uh, a rotation of spin, if you want, unitary transformation representing the transformation in SU2, I can write as the exponential of I, and then I get some vector, let's say, I don't know what to call it, maybe A, dot with uh, the block, what is called the block vector. And this is a vector made of the Pauli matrices, right? I don't know if um, this is the way you've seen it, but I'm gonna bet that this is the way you've seen it. Okay. Right, likewise, so this is uh, a little bit of a, of a primer that you see in, uh, in your quantum courses about the fact that from, uh, <laughs> as you can define, well, a group is generated by an algebra, in particular, a Lie group is generated by a Lie algebra that generates that group, okay, through the exponential map. You have seen this in quantum mechanics, and again, this is not, same as happened with the translation group, this is not exclusive of quantum mechanics. So today, I'm gonna, we're gonna briefly see how to represent uh, elements of the groups uh, SO plus one, three, which is the Lorentz group for the proper orthochronous Lorentz group, Again, we're going to represent it in terms of elements of its algebra generated by ele elements of its algebra and the exponential map. And that will allow us to understand this group as the group of rotations in space-time, whereas when you rotate with respect to two directions, including time, then the rotation is going to have something like an imaginary angle. This is a perspective on the Lorentz transformations, on the Lorentz boosts and the rotations that I'm pretty sure you have not, very likely, you have not seen before in previous courses, at this university anyways. Now, why is this important? Because there is a key element about Lorentz transformation, which is the fact that rotations and boosts do not close a group. You cannot separate them. They're part of the same group and you cannot separate the two. They're not subgroups. They mix with each other. And that, and that is very important because in Galilean physics that didn't happen. And that is the most striking difference between the Galilei group and the Lorentz group and the Poincaré group, okay? In the Galilei group. And that's the most striking difference between the Galilei group and the Poincaré group. All right, this is uh, gonna be a little bit beyond what you've seen before, so pay attention and at points when there's, um, pay attention. And I will also refer you for some of the details to the notes that are posted online. But what is important here is that you follow the logic and the reasoning. The arithmetics, all the long, long arithmetics, we will do some, but most of it are gonna outsource it to the notes in which is done in full detail. All right, let's get to it. All right, taking a look at the boosts only, the boosts that you know and love. This is the, the Lorentz boots for arbitrary direction of the velocity. I took the liberty of adding multiplying by C, the equation for T. That's just why, because we're going to try to write more covariant as we go. And if we write covariantly, remember that x0 is the CT component, all right? Of course, these are linear transformations, and as such, can be represented by matrices. I can think of 
uh, okay, I have the coordinates, the position vector of whatever event I want in the reference frame S and prime, and I want the prime one, I just multiply by a matrix that does it for me, implements the transformation. This is just this equation. The components of the vector change with lambda tilde when I change bases, okay? Changes bases in this case is a change of reference frame. All right, so what are, I can ask, what are the components, the entries of this matrix? Well, very easy, because you see here, okay, let's check uh, the first two, for example. Uh, what is the zero, zero component? Well, the zero, zero will give me ct prime as a function of ct, x, y, and z. All right, so let's see, ct prime. The first component is, what is the coefficient of t in the expression for ct prime? Well, it's just gamma, well, ct, right? So it's gamma, there you go, zero, zero is gamma. This is the first entry of the matrix, gamma, all right? What about the second one? What about the, the zero i component? Zero i component, very easy. So what is the component of t prime, the coefficient of the equation of t prime on the right that multiplies x i? Well, it's minus v divided by c. All right, cool, yeah. And then with a gamma, of course, that I forgot. So minus gamma v i divided by c. Those are the coefficients, you can tell. This one, it's slightly more complicated, but not that much. Let's just see a particular case that I'm pretty sure you've seen in previous courses. What happens if uh, the velocity v1 is actually, we call it v, and then we make v2 equals v3 equal to zero. What happens in that case? Keep in mind, by the way, that uh, vi is numerically equal to v sub i, because those are spatial indices. And remember, to lower and raise indices, you multiply by the metric, and the metric is minus one, 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 one. So the spatial components are lower and raised with the identity, and therefore don't change sign. Okay, it would be the time component of a four vector that would change sign. So they are numerically the same, that means that this is the same as v sub one. And this is the same, of course, as v sub two or v sub three because they coincide. All right, so let's compute what would be the transformation that we have in this case. Let's compute the matrix. That would be ct prime and x, y, z, right? Prime, prime, prime would be equal to some four by four matrix, and then ct, x, y, z. All right, very easy, let's put it here, zero, zero, the zero, zero component, we already saw it was done. Wonderful. What about the zero i components? Well, the zero two and zero three have v two and v three, which are zero. So those ones I can already write here. And also here, this matrix is symmetric, you can tell. And uh, I'm missing one entry. So what is the zero one entry? Well, the zero one entry is minus gamma. So minus gamma V1, V1 is V, so V divided by C. And I get the same here, minus gamma V divided by C. All right, wonderful. So uh, what happens with the spatial entries? Well, let's see. The non-diagonal entries first. Very easy, the non-diagonal entries, this term is zero for the non-diagonal entries, it's a Kronecker delta, it's the identity, right? And these ones are also zero uh, for the non-diagonal entries because they will always, all the non-diagonal entries will have at least a V2 or a V3. Therefore, they are zero. So the non-diagonal entries, zero, 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 zero. We are just left with the spatial diagonal entries, let's see. Okay, first of all, the one, one component. Okay, so for the one, one component, let's just write it here. For the one, one component, so lambda tilde one, one would be equal to delta one, one. That's nice, that's a one. Plus gamma minus one, that multiplies V1, V1 divided by V squared. But that's nice because V1 is V and V1 is V. So this is V squared over V squared. So this thing cancels. And that's nice, because this is one minus one, that cancels, and all that is left is gamma. So I get a gamma here. Finally, what about the other two diagonal entries? Well, for the other two diagonal entries, V2 is equal to zero, V3 is equal to zero, so this whole term cancels, just the identity is left. The chronicle delta, so it's only one and a one. All right? So this is the transformation between the two reference frames between an event in the reference frame S and an, ev an event in the reference frame S prime, the coordinates of that event, uh, from the point of view of a reference frame S prime that is boosted by a velocity V uh, in the direction of X. 
Now, this matrix, I'm pretty sure that this is what you've seen in previous courses for Lorentz transformations in a matrix form, right? Now, uh, let's see what we get when we apply, just for, for fun and to make sure that we recover the Lorentz transformations we remember. Uh, so yeah, let's do the first one. So CT, let's do this matrix product. So clearly you can tell that Y prime equals Y and Z prime equals Z because this is the identity and there's a zero and a zero and a zero and a zero here. Okay? So let's see what happens with CT prime and X prime. So CT prime, it's equal to gamma CT uh, minus uh, gamma V over C X. Now we can simplify dividing by C and taking the gamma as common factor and we get gamma that multiplies T minus uh, V divided by C squared X. All right. And then what happens with X prime? Well, X prime is equal to, let's see, gamma minus gamma V divided by C, CT plus gamma X. And then we can simplify, uh, taking the gamma, well, this cancels this, right? And taking the gamma as common factor. So we get gamma X minus uh, V, oops, sorry, V, T. And there you go. Those are the Lorentz transformations that we knew for uh, when the velocity is in the direction of X. So we all agree that this is the matrix representation for uh, these, uh, these boosts, right? Okay. Now, one thing that I'm going to say is that I'm doing passive transformations. So in passive transformations, uh, the reference frame is boosted, uh, not the events are not boosted. So it's like I move to a reference frame, uh, I am the one that carries the reference frame and I take getting a car <laughs> and I'm boosted. Equivalently, you could have thought of an active transformation in which the thing that I'm watching is the one that gets in a car and moves. So active versus passive. What is the relationship between the two? Well, the direction of velocity. So if I do a passive transformation of velocity V is the same as an active transformation of velocity minus V. All right, just to make it clear. But you see, this is just boosts. And of course, you know also that you can write rotation matrices, right? You can have a general form for a rotation matrix. If I, I have axes like that and I do a, let's, let's, let's write like this, right? How about that? Ah, no, I need three axes. I have three axes. Right? So if I do a rotation, the axis change with respect to the original axis. But what happens when I do a boost? What does a boost do to the axis? Well, to understand that, let's recall that this is a very limited set of Lorentz transformations. Because this is just the boosts. What about the rotations? The rotations do the same. Can we actually understand the entirety of the Lorentz group? And the answer is yes. We can repeat the same kind of analysis that we did with the translation group repeat it with the Lorentz group, okay? Now, I'm not going to get into the micro details and the arithmetics of it. I'm going to sketch this, but the full details is, are going to be provided in the notes. So it's not that you have to do them on your own. I'll give you the full details, the full arithmetics. But uh, let's summarize it in here before we get to our computer and start playing with it. Okay, so consider a differential Lorentz transformation. So if you want to think physics-wise, a Lorentz transformation of a little tiny bit of uh, action, Action. All right. All right. Consider a differential Lorentz transformation. Now, you want to think physics-wise, a transformation by a very small amount <laughs> between two different reference frames. All right. So we have the transformation, same as we did exactly the same as we did with the translation group. We can expand it, again, to leading order and neglect the higher orders, right? And uh, let me write it like that. It's the identity plus something small. Now, what do I write the identity? One question that I often get is, what do you write the identity for the differential transformation? Well, I need the identity, right? First of all, I mean, when I do nothing, so if the transformation, the thing that really does something, if, if I do, instead of taking a small step in the transformation, I do nothing, well, the linear operator that I have to apply to x to transform into x prime is the identity, as in doing nothing. So the identity is the zero order contribution. It's much easier seen if I actually write, okay, I write uh, x prime mu, it's equal to lambda tilde uh, mu nu x no, right? And now let's do this expansion. Let's not consider a differential. Let's consider a delta, for example, right? Let's consider the expansion where this is some finite amount of transformation. So I would get here uh, identity mu nu plus some delta omega tilde mu nu, right? And then I would get here x nu. 
Well, of course, uh, the result of that, let me just write it here, would be that x prime mu would be equal to delta nu mu x nu plus delta omega tilde mu nu x nu, right? Now, what is this thing? Well, this thing is a Kronecker delta, so it's the x mu. Wonderful. So I can put the x mu on the other side, and I get x prime mu minus x mu equals delta w uh, delta uh, tilde mu nu x nu. Now, I can call this thing delta x prime mu, and then I can make the whole thing differential, a la physicist, that considering the distance making is small, so what I do is a small increment, to the, even to differentially small, so the x prime mu would be equal to d omega tilde mu nu x nu. And then you see how this is exactly the parallel that we had in the case of the translation group. So the next step is going to find a relationship between the d omega and the d omega tilde. A relationship between them is easy to find, making use of the following. Remember that lambda inverse transpose is lambda tilde, and we already derived in the previous video that that means that uh, lambda tilde, contraction of the second index with the second index of lambda, gives me the identity. And that's easy to see because this is the inverse transpose, right? So I can write this as I can do a double transpose and I get lambda tilde transpose rho mu and then I have here lambda new rho, just a bit of a reminder. But then uh, lambda tilde is the inverse transpose. So if I substitute that, that would be lambda nu rho, then lambda inverse transpose transpose uh, rho mu. The transpose cancel, double transpose is the same, so it's the product of lambda and its inverse, and of course this is the identity nu mu. Okay? So knowing that, we can now substitute these expressions, the leading order expansions if you want, but for an infinitesimally small <laughs> Lorentz transformation, in here, and see what we get. So this guy is this guy, and this guy is this guy, using this expression. So what do I get when I do this product? Alright, well let's do all the terms. Let's just write the equality again. I have delta nu mu, and this is equal to the delta with delta, I'll just write it. Delta mu rho, delta rho nu. Okay? Now I get plus delta mu rho d nu rho. Oops, sorry. D omega nu rho. Then plus uh, delta nu rho, d omega tilde mu rho. Plus the cross term of these two, differential times differential, but that's higher order. Remember, we're staying only a leading order, so it's, a, it's an infinitesimally small uh, transformation. So higher order terms are not there, okay? If it were a very small one, can be neglected. If it's infinitesimally small, they're not there, <laughs> okay? All right, so what do I get here? Uh, that means that delta nu mu is equal. So this thing, right, basically this is summing of a row, so it's telling you that the row becomes a mu, if you want. So it's a mu nu, plus, and the same thing here, this becomes a mu, d omega uh, uh, nu mu, plus, and this one, d omega tilde uh, mu nu. This row is a little bit oversized. All right, so, interesting. So this one cancels, and that means that d omega nu mu is equal to minus d omega tilde mu nu. Additionally to that relation, we know that uh, from the relation that we found in the previous video, that the coefficients of the metric tensor are invariant under the Lorentz group. So, wonderful. Uh, we can use this relation to the leading order, so if I expand this relation, I would get uh, eta mu nu, and let's just expand, rho nu, so rho mu, so we have delta rho mu plus d omega rho mu, and then I have again delta sigma nu, then plus d omega sigma nu, all right, equal to eta rho sigma. Okay, now same as before, 
I can multiply these two things. Uh, second order terms I'm not going to write. And then we get writing this one on the left hand side. And I'm going to get eta mu nu that multiplies, and then I did the product of the two deltas, rho mu and then delta sigma nu plus the cross products. Uh, this one with this one, so delta rho mu d omega sigma nu plus delta sigma nu d omega rho mu. And again, I don't write the cross terms that are higher order. Okay, so uh, let's apply these deltas. And this, this means this is equal to, and I'm gonna write, well, I'll write everything. Eta rho sigma, it's equal to, now the two deltas, term by term. That one substitutes the mu by a rho and the nu by a sigma. So I get rho sigma. All right, this is this times that. Now next, I'm gonna get eta, this uh, delta substitute the, the mu by a rho. So it's a rho nu, d omega sigma nu. Nu is kind of weird, nu. Plus, uh, and this one substitutes the nu by a sigma, so eta and mu sigma, the omega rho mu. Next step, this thing is lowering in the lowering the index uh, nu and transforming into a rho, and this one is lowering the index mu and transforming into a sigma. So what this gives me is that uh, these two things cancel. <laughs> All right. So what I get is lowering the indices d omega sigma rho uh, plus d omega rho sigma equals zero so look at that <laughs> that means that d omega sigma rho equals minus d omega rho sigma so so look at that d omega uh, let's call it uh, sigma rho is uh, fully anti-symmetric that means that uh, the diagonals are zero, and there's only, because it's a four by four matrix, if you want, there's only six free entries, six degrees of freedom, six parameters that fully characterize the Lorentz transformation. Now, with that relation, and the relation we found right before between d omega and d omega tilde, we can now solve for one of those parameters differentially. Let's give you a sketch of how to do it. To understand what we're going to do now, I have to introduce something that you probably have seen in previous courses, but if not, I will introduce it again, which is the fully anti-symmetric symbol, also called the Levi-Civita symbol. Levi-Civita symbol, that I'm going to call epsilon, like that, and with indices, let's say, uh, A, B, C, D, E, etc. Okay, so that is an object that has n indices, and then uh, I define this, I'm going to give you the high school like definition of it, which is uh, 1 for any even permutation of the sequence 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, all the way to n, uh, minus 1 for any odd permutation and uh, zero for any repetition of indices. All right, for example, if I write the epsilon, let's see three indices, one, two, three. That's, this is the object with three indices, i, j, k, right? So I say one, two, three. Well, this one is an even permutation of one, two, three. So this thing is one. Now, any even permutation would be, for example, any with three numbers is very easy with three indices because anything that reads one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, when you repeat it would be one. For example, two, three, one. How does that read? Well, it reads two, three, one, 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 two, three. All right, yeah, this is one. You can't tell it's an even permutation because I permuted twice. I permuted uh, the one with the three and then the two with the three. And that gives me this one. With three indices, very easy. Can you read one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three? Then one. For example, I don't know, three, uh, one, two. Three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Oh yeah, that's an even permutation as well, one. If you can't 
So if you have two, uh, one, three, two, one, three, two, two, one, three, two, one, three, two, one, three, that doesn't sound right. This is another permutation. This is minus one. And of course, any repetitions. So if I have one, one, three, that is zero. If I repeat indices, it's zero. All right, it's slightly more difficult. Well, it's more difficult if you have more indices uh, because uh, having an order and permutation now with four or more indices is no longer just reading it like that. Uh, there's a trick, there's a result from graph theory, very easy. So imagine that I have, uh, for example, a symbol with six indices, right? So imagine that I have epsilon, uh, I, J, K, L, M, N. And I want to know the sign of, uh, I don't know, I want to know, I know, of course, that epsilon 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 is 1. But I want to know, for example, epsilon 6, 1, 2, 4, 5, 3, for example. Is that positive or negative? Is it an even or an odd permutation? Well, let me tell you a, a quick uh, graph theory calculation that tells you exactly the sign. So you write the natural permutation, 1, 2, three, four, five, six. And then you write here the permutation you want to know the sign of. Six, one, two, uh, four, five, three. And then you just join them. So the one with the one, the two with the two, the three with the three, the five with the five, the four with the four, the six with the six. And then you count the number of crossings. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven crossings is an odd number, and therefore, this is minus one. So if you count the number of crossings, then you get the odd or even nature of the permutation. That's a trick. All right, so I could actually have defined the levi civita symbol as simply, it's uh, one for one, two, three, four, five, to n, right? And it's fully anti-symmetric. <laughs> that already for a definition, that's the adult definition of the levi civita symbol, telling you that it's one for this uh, entry, and it's fully anti-symmetric. And that will tell you already everything you need to know. It's anti-symmetric in all their indices. All right, so now that you get this primer of what the levi civita symbol is, we can continue with the derivation. Okay, so we have learned two things. The omega mu nu is actually equal to minus the omega tilde uh, nu mu. And we've also learned that the omega mu nu is equal to minus the omega nu mu. So an infinitesimal transformation, dx mu, it's equal, of course, to d, uh, as we saw before, d omega tilde uh, mu nu x nu, and this thing only has six degrees of freedom because we have the constraints of this thing being fully anti-symmetric. All right, so the next step is go and separate this. Uh, let's set ourselves in a reference frame and let's separate boost that we know the formulas for from rotations that we know the formulas for because we have rotation matrices. Now, if we do the boost first, differentiating the boost, which is done in the nodes and it's easy to see just looking at the boost, we get that for the, let's see, for an infinitesimal, infini, infinitesimal, pure boost of velocity dvi. So I go to the expressions for the Lorentz boost that we computed before, and we take an infinitesimal small boost of d, we differentiate that, and we get a, a, a boost, or well, be the dt, and uh, the uh, dt prime and the x prime that you would get when you apply a boost like this, we find that the components of omega are the omega zero i equals to c minus one dvi, and all the other components are zero. Clarification. There are two things that I will call rapidity in this video, and my apologies about that, I just realized. Now, the proper thing that we should call rapidity is this vector here. This vector is a vector that has direction of the velocity, and you can tell that the magnitude is related to the arc tangent of v divided by c, the modulus of v divided by c. Uh, throughout this derivation, I'm calling rapidity vector even with the same character, I'm calling, it, I'm calling this quantity here. Well, you can ignore that as called rapidity. Actually, I decided not to use it. The proper rapidity is going to be this thing here. So if you see on the board something along this line, you can safely ignore it. Sorry about this. Let's go back to the main video. 
Now, we can do the same for an infinitesimal rotation, and for an infinitesimal rotation, we obtain that d omega ij equals minus epsilon ijk d theta k, where this d theta k are the angles of rotation in clockwise direction. So you have a vector of rotations, in this case d theta, which is d theta 1, d theta 2, d theta 3, where this d theta vector uh, gets the angle of rotation with respect to the three axes in counterclockwise direction. Uh, again, this, with this minus here is the usual counterclockwise for positive angle of rotation. So a recap, how do we obtain these two? Because this is probably the fastest going on the video so far, the only two things that I haven't done in full detail. Let me just recap how I did it. I took the matrices that we obtained before for the pure boosts in a frame, and I differentiated them, and I obtained is comparing the two expressions, comparing this expression with uh, the one that I got from differentiating the boost, I obtained this one for the pure rotations, which is a, a rotation, infinitesimal rotation of angle delta phi around the direction of this axis, all right? So how do I do it? Well, I went to the a general rotation matrix from your linear algebra, and I differentiated that, and I compared with this, okay? And I identified terms. It's a lengthy, a slightly lengthy process in terms of doing the arithmetic, and it's a good exercise to practice, so I recommend you do it. It's also done in the notes. And because I don't like you to have to believe anything, we're gonna definitely check this. So you see that I'm not BSing you <laughs> with this. We're gonna check it right after using and playing a little bit with it in Mathematica. But anyway, we obtained that. What is the next step? Well, the next step is to put everything together and collect it in a compact expression. And that compact expression, I can write as follows. And the details of this are done in the notes. Let me just write it here. Gathering these expressions, we can actually write the following one. A differential transformation can be decomposed into a part that is associated with a boost and a part that is associated to a rotation. Now, of course, we can integrate this expression the same way we did with translations to get the, the exponential of i alpha p for the translations. Now we get with the Lorentz transformation. And this Lorentz transformation is also expressed as a, in, as a complex exponential, if you want, of the, you know, the four vector x prime is, get, is gotten after applying this operator here, which is gonna be a four by four matrix on the four vector x. Now, this is theta, remember, is the, the, the direction of theta gives you the direction, the, the axis of rotation, and the magnitude of theta gives you the angle of the rotation counterclockwise. And this is the rapidity vector, which is the vector here. This vector is a vector that has direction of the velocity, and you can tell that the magnitude is related to the arc tangent of v divided by c. Now, this is where things get a bit complicated, because this object, this vector object here, is, has three components, s1, s2, s3, each of them a matrix. And that should remind you of an object that you have used in quantum mechanics, the Pauli vector, right? Where you have Pauli matrices in there, and then you generate a rotation with exponential of i, so theta dot the Pauli vector, right? That you have done in your quantum courses. Uh, here we get something very similar, and in fact, the commutation relationships between these objects, between the what we call the generators, because here I'm presenting you the Lie algebra, the algebra that generates the Lorentz group. So the commutation relation between the ones associated with rotations, the S matrices, the one here that are associated with rotations, are exactly the same as you found with the Pauli matrices, if you remember. You get that, uh, you know, Sx, Sy is equal to minus I, Sz. And that's exactly what you got with Pauli matrices. Now, this is the same as in the Galilei group. The generator of rotations are exactly the same as you would have obtained with our relativistic physics. If you want to see how you get it and how it is in the Galilei group, uh, check the notes that I have for my Quantum Theory 2 course, where I actually do the Galilei group structure constants. Anyway, so this is exactly the same as you would expect for spatial rotations in without relativity. Now, the difference with the Galilei group is that doing two boosts in the Galilei group they commute. One boost in one direction, and one boost in, boost in another direction, they commute. Here they don't. Two boosts commute to a rotation, and of course a rotation and a boost uh, commute to a boost, which is also true in Galilean physics. The new one is this one. Two boosts don't commute, and this is the weird part. This is what is different in the Lorentz group, and by extension the Poincaré group, 
and in the Galilei group. This is what is new. You can't really talk. So, okay, hold on. Are we talking about boosts or is it a rotation? Well, two boosts could be a boost and a rotation. And that depends on the reference frame. And you say, what? Are you telling me that that depends on the reference frame? Yes, I'm telling you that. The same way that what is time or what is space mixes. When you change reference frame, right, the Lorentz transformation mixes time and space. Well, the Lorentz transformation mixes boost and rotation in a very similar way. So you cannot really separate boost and rotations. Now, I know that you may find, or most of you may find this a very weird way. This is the kind of thing that when you're watching the video, it's like, what is this guy talking about? How am I supposed to understand that? I was very happy when I was doing Lorentz transformations, putting a T and an X and doing my stuff. All right. Let's understand a little bit better uh, what this is uh, with a couple of examples and then going to a computer and playing with it. Because I think what is needed now to really understand the abstract stuff is seeing it at work and seeing how this is the most powerful way of writing a Lorentz transformation. So let's do a couple of particular cases here and then we go to the computer and we compare what you used to know when the, with the new outrageous formula that I gave you for a Lorentz transformation. Let's do that. All right. So I have here the, Lorentz, the general Lorentz transformation in which I'm, it makes no sense to separate rotations and, and boost uh, outside of the argument of the exponential. Also, remember that you can't separate this as the product of two exponentials, doing the, the boost first and the rotation uh, after, uh, because these two things don't commute. <laughs> the case and the S's don't commute. So one has to be careful when one does this separation, right? Anyway, point being, I found here a particular representation of this algebra. This algebra here from the Lorentz group, okay? This algebra that I have here for the proper orthochronous Lorentz group, uh, I can represent with these matrices. You can check that these matrices satisfy these commutation relationships. So this is a four vector representation of the Lorentz group. Now, it's something interesting to mention before we do a calculation, a couple of things. This is not the only representation we can take for this group. And in fact, uh, if you have taken quantum theory two with me, and if not, you can check my notes. One of the things that I do there is derive uh, the Schrodinger equation out of the symmetries of uh, spacetime, of Galilean spacetime. And then I find that the only possible equation for time evolution in quantum mechanics is Schrodinger equation, right? If we assume that we have a particle that satisfies respects the symmetries of spacetime. Now, do you know what happens when we demand that the equations of motion for a quantum system uh, satisfies the symmetries of the Poincaré group, the relativistic one? Well, it happens that I have infinitely many different representations that I can take. Each of them will give me a different equation of motion. If I take the, one of the representations in particular, one associated with spin one half particles, then what I get is the Dirac equation. Now, this is interesting. Spin in quantum mechanics it's not really coming from quantum mechanics. Spin, if you remember when you were told about the Dirac equation, the Dirac equation predicted spin and predicted the existence of particles and antiparticles. These two things are predicted when we put relativity to work with quantum. And spin in itself is not, and this is something we should talk about a little bit, spin in quantum mechanics was actually put there with a shoehorn. People were doing stenger lach experiments and realized there's something like an intrinsic angular momentum in electrons so we need to, in Schrodinger equation, why write spinners instead of the useful wave functions. Now, what uh, we have here is that in relativity, the different equations that actually have spinners as their objects, right, appear out of taking different representations of the Poincaré group. Spin is a consequence of relativity. Now, of course, if you have to have uh, something with spin in a classical system, you need it to have some structure. In quantum mechanics, spin can appear intrinsically, but still, it's a relativistic thing. It's not a quantum thing. Spin comes from relativity. Spin one half, Dirac equation. You know what happens if I take uh, the spin one representation for this? I get Maxwell equations if it's a massless representation, or, or uh, electromagnetism with a mass if it's not a massless representation. It depends, that's related with something called central extensions of the group, but I'm not gonna talk too much about that. You know what you get? When, um, when you actually uh, take the, I don't know, the spin three halves representation, you get the Schrodinger equation. You know what happens when I take the spin two representation? I get linearized gravity. I get the equation for gravitational waves. 
and I get for free propagation of gravitational waves. And I get that before doing general relativity, out of assuming that I have things of spin too. <laughs> Propagated in a way, it will be in a way in time that satisfies the symmetries of flat space time, the Poincare group. So uh, you see, spin and the equivalence of motion that come from objects with spin that have to set respect the symmetries of space time don't come from quantum theory, they come already from special relativity. And we will talk more about that when we see general relativity and we talk a bit about linearized gravity. Now, for now, I think that the message that I want you to take from is that spin appears from taking different representations of the Poincaré group. <laughs> different representations give you different dynamics. If you take the scalar representations, then you're going to get something like um, uh, the klein gordon equation, which is also relativistic. Anyway, that said, again, sorry about that. I'm going to try to wave my hands the smallest amount possible in this course. I did a little bit of waving hands here because we haven't seen enough to really show you with a derivation of that. If you want to see a rigorous derivation of all this, it's in the book by Weinberg, The Quantum Theory of Fields, uh, Volume 1. Be careful with Weinberg because he uses the, no the convention for science that is perfectly valid. This is the one that we nicknamed the wrong notation. It's easy to remember because Weinberg starts with a W, so you know what notation he uses. That's not necessarily true always because Wolf, for example, starts with a W and uses the one that we nicknamed the right notation. But then again, that's Wald, right? <laughs> anyway, let's see. Uh, what we have here is a four vector representation of the Lorentz group, the algebra that generates the Lorentz group. And now we're going to compute the Lorentz transformation associated with two particular cases. Let's do a pure rotation and a pure boost. Okay? Let's start with the pure rotation, which is something that you're familiar with. So that's what you get. Uh, you substitute these matrices here, take the exponential of the matrix that you learned how to do in algebra, and this is the result you get. You don't have to believe me, I just want it here for reference because we're going to do it in the computer next. Now, what happens, uh, this of course you recognize because if, this is a if you act on this, on the vector ct, x, y, z, right, this thing is a rotation of the spatial component components around the z-axis of magnitude uh, theta, which is exactly what this does. Now, what happens if we have a pure boost? Now, for a pure boost, we need to compute the rapidity. Let's write the pure boost here. So if we have a pure boost in the x-direction, we know the rapidity vector is given by this. The direction is the x-axis, and the magnitude I call it psi, which is given by this rapidity. And uh, the, ang the angle rotation is zero. I don't rotate. I keep, uh, it's just a boost, a pure boost. Now, if I compute with the exponential of the matrix, I obtain this. And this expression, uh, it's uh, the boost transforming. I can think of the boost as acting like that. And you would think, hold on, but you gave me a pure boost. And it didn't look like that. It looked like a gamma here, minus gamma V divided by C and things like that. So how come you have a hyperbolic cosine of that and a sine of that? Is that, is that true? Yes, it's true. And we're going to see it. Uh, now, the interesting thing is comparing this and that is that this thing looks like a rotation. But honestly, it, this also looks like a rotation. It's a lot like a rotation. Cosine, cosine, sine, sine. Only that you have cinches and cautious. And if you remember, uh, the cinches and cautious are related with the sines and cosines by the fact that one becomes the other with some constant, some i sometimes, and then uh, changing the angle to an imaginary angle. Because as you can tell, the hyperbolic cosine of theta can be thought of as a cosine of an imaginary angle, and the hyperbolic sine of theta can be thought of as a sine of imaginary angle with some constant, with some i in there. So in a way, this is, well, this is actually a, what we call a hyperbolic rotation. So the boosts are nothing but a hyperbolic rotation on the x and t axis, right? Or the z and t axis, the spatial axis and the time axis. And is, you can think of hyperbolic rotation, a rotation generated by a generator that's tangent to the hyperbola if you want, but not a rotation in the sense of... So the same way that a rotation is generated by a, a vector that is tangent to a circle, uh, this hyperbolic rotation is generated by a vector that is tangent to a hyperbola. And we will see what it does. Uh, you can tell that this hyperbolic rotation is the same as a rotation by an imaginary angle, in a way, in many ways, right? So yeah, a boost is just a rotation by an imaginary angle on, uh, with respect to, in a way, with respect between a rotation in the plane including t and some other spatial components. <laughs> That's a way of thinking about it. All right, so we're going to compute all this with Mathematica and illustrate it and discuss what happens with the axis and the boost and understand graphically and geometrically a little bit better all this. 
But I, I would like you to do something. I would like you to prove this. I would like you, using these matrices, using this and this data, to prove these expressions. Uh, those are things that I often give you in an assignment, and there might be an assignment around that. And if not, it may be one of the exercises that I'll do for you at some point. But uh, I want you to practice this. And I'm going to give you a couple of expressions that I also recommend that you prove these expressions uh, because they're very useful expressions and proving them is a good exercise. And those are the expressions that you can use to compute to go from here to here. Okay? Let me just give them to you. All right, so these two expressions is the how to expand the exponential. Uh, this is, remember, this vector is a unique vector in the direction of psi, and this is the magnitude of psi. So this vector times k, and this vector, which is, again, this is the theta vector. This thing is the, the psi vector, right? Because it's the vector magnitude times its direction. And this is the theta vector. So you can express it as this expansion in terms of sines and cosines or hyperbolic sines and cosines. How do you do that? Well, you need to use two things. Taylor expansions, Taylor expand the exponential. Now, know that these matrices are nilpotent. So if you take the square, well, are nilpotent at some power. So if you, I would just check what is the square of this matrix, what is the third power, what is the fourth power? Same for all the matrices here. They have something in common. Take the powers of those matrices so you may be able to write the powers of those matrices as a function of something else. If you do it, you will see it. And then collect and gather the Taylor expansion for the hyperbolic sine, hyperbolic cosine, the sine, and the cosine, and you will be able to prove it. It's a really good exercise, and it was, it's been at times an assignment exercise. It could be this time. I don't know. We'll see. All right. So uh, without further ado, let's actually show that this is actually true and how cool this, this is. And let's try to understand geometrically a little bit better the Poincaré group. Same as it happened with the previous video. This video got quite long and I don't want to make you watch videos that are super long. So I will deal with the rest of the Poincaré group, including the computer visualization of it and some comments around, along the lines of getting a deeper understanding of what it does to reference frames in the next video. See you then. And until then, take care.